at the Baking Steel Studio, live from Grand Rapids. We have Mike Rohde with us, a special guest. We're going to talk about Mike in just a minute. Uh, in fact, I'm going to introduce him right now to you guys. Mike, give us your give us your pitch. Tell us, you know, your, your background. Where's your book? Give your book. It's right over here. It's right underneath the pizza there. Book off the right here. This guy. Go ahead. So the story is I'm a graphic designer, turned UI designer, turned UX designer, but all along the way, I've always done drawing. And eventually, in uh, about 12 years ago, I wrote that book, Sketchnote Handbook, showing you how to take uh, visual notes. So using your capabilities as a visual person. Like incredible guys. At like what, no whatever people. level you're at, so that you expand beyond just writing and use your visual capabilities. And that teaches you how to do that. So wrote that about 12 years ago, wrote a second book about 10 years ago. And now I do a lot of teaching around that space, teaching people how to- And how many copies? Skill. Like- I think it's up around 70, 70 80, 000, maybe. That's legit. That's street cred. That's a lot. Multiple. I think we have uh, it's in uh, Chinese, Vietnamese, German, French, Russian, Ukrainian, um, Czech. Czech. Are the languages it's been translated into. Awesome. So uh, yeah, across all the books, it's that's all guerrilla sales. And, so. and and we met on Instagram a couple of years back, and we traded. I gave him steals. He gave me <laughs> he gave me books. Um, and we became friends and we've been friends ever since. And we just talk and he, you know, he's done, an, he did a class with us mobily a mm -hmm. month or two ago. Yeah, on sketch and noting. Sketch he noting. I wish I knew Mike in school because I don't know about you guys, I love to doodle. And if it was, if it was a practical doodle, if it, if it was meaningful and it helped me remember things, I would have been a better student. Yeah. Then you may not have had the baking steel today. So yeah. we lucked out. Um, <laughs> so Marla's asking for the name of the book again. We can oh, yes. show it to you. It's the sketch note handbook. You can, get I, it on, you can find that on Amazon. And we'll link to this, guys, in the follow-up email tomorrow yeah. uh, that we have with everybody here. And anyway, Mike has been um, loves making Detroit-style pizza. So I said, hey, next time you're out in the Grand Rapids area, let's get together. He's yeah. a couple of hours away. And we drove out. And today, we're going to do Detroit-style pizza. It's going to be incredible. We're also filming a new episode of Sauce Talk after this. It's our new like video cast on YouTube. We'll also link to that. But I think this weekend, it's like episode number three. And we're looking for more guests too. So if anybody wants to be a guest, you just let me know. Um, in any case, today, Detroit style. And we're going to work backwards today. Meaning I'm going to, because of the, we want to get this thing in the oven so you can see it when it's completed. We're going to start with the, making the pizza. And Mike's going to really help with that. And then we're going to jump into the dough making. And of course, answering all of your questions. It'd be really fun when you get questions drop them in the box if we miss it just don't be afraid to type it back in we'll try to get to it afterwards yeah. so let's go right into the the dough stretching and we're using a um a 500 gram batch of dough okay and it looks like this cool this is a, a 500 gram dough ball i'm not gonna even, I, I got it covered about four hours ago I removed these from the fridge. I made a big dough ball of the batch of dough. I oiled up this USA pan in the bottom and we just placed the dough inside. In fact, I did this last night and the idea is it's fermenting. But when I got up this morning, I came in around eight this morning, I removed it from the fridge and let this rest at room temperature. And the idea is it's going to start to ferment and it start to spread, right? And we're going to remove this um, I spread it by using my fingers. So I've got one here that we started doing about a half hour ago. Again, this was removed at eight o'clock. I'm just trying to get this to cover all the corners if I can. And we got to do that by being patient, not going uh, too fast, right? It's backwards here, right? Just kind of lightly pressing it out. You can see the corners are almost there. It's kind of basically like focaccia bread, right, Andres? It's just like, exactly right. It's just, this is the pizza dough, right? It's our same dough recipe. Uh, you you could alter that if you'd like. I use the same dough virtually for all my pizzas yeah, and too. doughs. It's just easier. It's more versatile. It works great, right? No reason to change it. Right. Works great. My, yeah. Why? Well, and you can see it's kind of right there, right? Yeah. All my corners there. Done. Now, Mike's going to talk about the the layering process, if you will. Okay. Yeah. So I could talk about. I've been practicing this since January. I got a a Detroit pan, and I think I'll maybe I'll do two of these. So sometimes I'll mix a couple of cheeses together. So I'm kind of nerdy. I'm very picky about the way I lay out my cheese. So the way I do it is I always start in the corner and I do it right at the edge because what I want 
is the Detroit style. You want that cheese to lace all along the edges of the dough. Sometimes I'll push the dough over. So I'll start like that. I know it's pretty nerdy. <laughs> and then like if I'm going to mix cheeses, um, maybe I'll get a some of this. So, so what we have is this is Wisconsin brick cheese I brought with me. This is uh, garlic. You can't obviously taste that over Zoom. Um, but it's got a little bit of garlic flavor. And then this is the yellow brick cheese. So it's traditional. It's not flavored in any way. And what I often do is I'll just alternate. I don't know. It's just kind of very pleasing. It's like meditation. <laughs> sort of like doing one of those uh, those Japanese uh, things where you're drawing in the sand or whatever, right? So Very zen. Very zen. Yeah, -like. zen. There you go. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. So we'll sort of, I try to do like alternating. You can do what you want to. And you're basically making this grid, you know, of cheese around the edge. So I start, I always start with the edge first, just to make sure that I'm not missing any edges. And that's that really, that's really helpful. Is that still good in the picture? Yeah, that's perfect. So, you know, it's going to eventually melt. So you're not going to be, it's going to sort of work. So I start there. So I do the corners, then I do the edges. I try to hold them up at the edge. And then I'll just sort of do the grid through the whole inside. I usually use a whole brick of cheese. We could probably get uh, a brick and show you what that looks like. If you yeah, want. I got one. So this stuff is all over the place in Wisconsin where I live. But we know that this is often not the case if you're especially out west. It's pretty tough to get this stuff. So here's, you buy it like this. Yeah. It's right? You can buy it in the square too like this. Yeah. Right? And just really easy to chop into cube. Yep. The story is that when they made this cheese, the Germans made this cheese, they used bricks to push it out of the container. So that's the history. That's where the name comes from. So some alternative cheeses that you might want to look into if you're out west or somewhere where Wisconsin brick cheese is either tough to get or really expensive to ship in. Uh, one that I'd heard was Munster is a really good one. Of course, mozzarella mm -hmm. works well. Um, like a low moisture moss. Yes, the low moisture. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, Monterey Jack works well. I would guess like white, like mild white cheddar sure. would also work. And you can just use what's in your fridge too. It, you know, as long as it melts, it's gonna be fine. Yeah, it's gonna be great. So one of the one of the reasons why people like or why this is popular, I'm not sure how it ended up in Detroit from Wisconsin, but um, it's got a higher fat content than mozzarella. Mm -hmm. So what that means is you end up with really beautiful melting properties. So this would be really good for like fondue. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I got it. So yeah. you could probably look at fondue cheeses and see. That's cool, man. It's so like this is what I do. I make like a grid, right? So you're like, you're like drawing something here. You're yeah, I don't know. Kind of nerdy that way. I love it. And what do you do now? What are you going to do with the sauce? So then I do the sauce next. So I, I sort of get the sauce. Andres has made his traditional sauce with, with uh, yeah, the San Marzano. Amazing. And so the story is, is that the Detroit likes racing stripes. So they just do like a, a stripe like this on the edge. Sometimes I use canned sauce. Depends on, you know, what's going on that week. Right, it's sure. insane. I'll just, Aldi makes actually pretty good pizza sauce. I was surprised. So I'll just do stripes just like this. One down the middle and one at the edge. I was thinking about this the other day. It actually works really well, depending on how you cut it. So when I have a lot of kids around, I do double cut. So I'll like cut it right right here and right here and sure. this way. And then you get, end up with a lot of little pieces. Yeah, I like it. Because cool. it's very yeah. filling. So the kids can have a couple of pieces that mm -hmm. way. If it's adults or you just want larger portions, which is more traditional, sure. you would cut it right down the middle and then cut it in like six or eight, mm -hmm. maybe eight slices. Sometimes it's kind of fun. I actually will cut it in narrow strips. So I'll do like more this way. Mm -hmm. So you just get a little, almost like a like a cheese bread. So it's not too much. Sure. And then you yeah, no, it's great. have a, a variety of them. So that's typically that's it. what it looks like. With the three stripes. That's great. Now, do you do any meats or anything like that? Or yeah, then pepperoni is typically okay. what you would do. We we are a meat family, mm -hmm. so uh, we will often do. I do raw um, pork sausage because it bakes in here. What I learned was I used to pre cook it like in a cast iron pan, which is fine, but I found that I didn't really have to do that. I could just put the right raw sausage in there, and it would it would cook. And then a lot of times, if we have bacon bits, we'll sprinkle bacon bits on there. So you can see I'm a little nerdy about everything lining up. I guess that's what happens from when you're a designer. You notice all these little details. It looks like a yeah, it's definitely a design. I love it. I love the like design. That pattern, right? That's beautiful. 
So there we go. So we're going to go, you guys take a peek at that. I'm going to go back to this, back to, back to us, right? For a second. And yeah. so we, we just made this, um, and, and, you know, I call it the lasagna of pizzas, which is mm -hmm. probably a taboo for the traditionalists. <laughs> However, what's nice about this style pizza is that we can make this ahead of time before the guests arrive. Right. You can make two or three of them, and then they can be baked. And then when you, you know, then you can make your salad and just enjoy, everyone can enjoy a slice or two, mm -hmm. which is awesome. So it makes it hand less hands on right. when the guests arrive. That's what I've noticed. Which is also a good thing sometimes to have to be hands on when the guests arrive too, because they can participate. This is just another style. Um, you can do dual styles. You could have people start with this, it's very heavy and but really tasty. Right? Yeah, I've done that before. Where I've done one of these and then done the stuff that you teach with. The, yeah, you know, traditional yep. hand stretch. Sure. It's and great. Then you got variety. So something I'll notice is that with little kids, we've had friends over too. That with this style, you end up with not a real like my daughter who's fourteen. She doesn't. She'll eat everything but the crust and give yeah. it to me, which is great for me because I like the crust. Right. But a lot of people don't. What's nice about this is the crust is not so chewy or intense so they'll eat the whole piece like kids will eat oh everything. right so oh, it's all equal from basically. a kid perspective as a mom or a dad yeah. you want to just have this ready to go and throw it in the oven and kids will eat all yeah. of it and i want to get this in the oven now too so we can get to some dough making however so my baking steels in the oven i got two oven's been preheating at 450 for the last hour or two maybe an hour same thing i want to place this pan directly on the steel yeah. and we're going to get the benefit of that steel blasting heat directly yeah. into our um Pan, if you will. So I put on, I'm just using the bottom rack. I'm going to set the timer for like 15 minutes just so I don't lose track. And that's literally our, how we make, design our, our Detroit style pizza in the bowl. And there's other ways of doing this. Some traditionalists might add their sauce at the end, their stripes. They might yeah. use very specific cheeses. Um, Cheddar, I know, is a blend, like a white cheddar is a blend that some people will use, which is not a brick cheese. They'll use it on the perimeter to help kind of create that lattice, if you will. I've oiled that pan lightly. That's a nice oil on top. Now I'm going to jump into making the dough. I know a lot of you have seen us make our dough. I want to show you how I would produce. This is going to make one pan pizza, this dough recipe. So follow along. What Mike's going to do is take some notes on how um, he sees me making dough. Yeah. So when he goes back home, he'll be able to create by looking at his notes. And you get, wait till you see the notes. We're going to show you. Yeah, we could do. We could we're going to show him. When you have the overhead, I this might be it. more interesting than what I'm doing. <laughs> so, um, in fact, when we do that, you want to do that? Can you, can you do that? Yeah, I can do that. You want me to be on camera while you're building? And yeah, you, I'm going to put Mike on camera and then I'm going to make the dough and I'll, I'll kind of say out loud what I'm doing. I mean, if it, if you got enough camera room, we could do both at the same time. I can be off at the edge and then just show you what I do. At the yeah, time. right. We could do both. We could do a little bit of both. But anyway, so here's new people here who right. have done dough before. Okay, so that's a good point. We'll, we'll do it. We'll kind of, we'll jump in a little bit. I've pre-measured 500 grams of bread flour. That's what we got in here. This is an organic bread flour from Central Milling. It's 500, 500 grams. And uh, now what I'll do is, I guess a little bit more of that. Be more than the pan, eight fifty total, which is great, right? Yeah. But I think the thing about the tray pizzas, if you're doing that, is more dough isn't worse, right? Like it's just you more want dough, it to be right. fluffy and it yes. gets even higher and fluffier. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna make like a big batch. This will be eight hundred grams. I use six hundred in that pan. This will be more than what we actually used. However, the, I use this in our book. This is the this is the recipe we used. So I zero my scale out. I'm gonna add in. Some sea salt, 16 grams. And this is coarse, fine's probably better than coarse, but I like I like coarse. 16 grams, my scale, and I'm just gonna take my whisk, give it a little shake. I'm gonna just whisk this around. I wanna incorporate the salt into the uh, flour. Very low skill here. All right, when I get this done, I'm going to take that aside, grab my micro scale, which is, you can see this thing measures to the one one hundredth of a gram. Oops. I'm just trying to get this grams. Okay, so I'm going to add one gram. And you can see that's not a lot. This is Fleshman's active dry yeast. That's one gram. It's probably about the size of a quarter mm -hmm. flat, right? I'd yep. say. Not a lot. It's nice because it can keep it in the fridge. I, that's what yes. I mean, the fridge. These, these little jars are great. 
piece. This is the jar I buy at the supermarket, flesh bins, active dry yeast, 113 grams. So in other words, I'd make this dough 113 times before this runs out, which means this will probably expire before I can do that. That's a, that's making dough every three days of the year, basically, right? Ish of my math. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to grab my whisk and just whisk this around. And I like to whisk because I don't want my salt and my yeast to come in direct contact with each other because it can kill off that yeast. So we whisk it around and that's good enough. It's not perfect, so it's good. Now I'm going to grab uh, some water. And for me, that's 350 grams of water. It's one thing. Isn't that quick? Time flies in. So now I'm going to grab my water. 350 grams. I pour it right in. Let's see what I'm doing. Oops, sorry. Three fifty seven, close enough. Move my scale. And I just grab my I grab a dough scraper before I get my hands in there. I kind of just push this around. Let that flour and water incorporate. I'll get my hands too dirty. I love these bowls because I'm able to, uh, in fact, they're back in stock at Baking Steel. Um, I'm able to contain my mess in my container. Is that, is that where the name came from, you think? Contain? Yes, yeah. <laughs> That's kind of nice the way the dough scraper fits the... It does, container. yeah. It's really nice. I have a Sterilite one that I use, so... So once running. I get this somewhat incorporated like this, I'm going to remove the dough scraper and get my hand involved. And if you've followed me before, I will only just drop this in there. Sorry, I will. I have two hands. I'm going to use one of them in the bowl, and I'm going to keep one dry in case my mom calls. I can grab the phone or somebody important, like my kids or my wife. Is that a culinary school? The culinary school trick, chef trick. Keep one wet hand, one dry hand at all times. I just, I just press this in until it forms one large mass. And really what I'm doing is I'm just making sure there's no dry clumps of flour. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I'm making my own rule right there, but I'm just pressing this in. I do this for about two or three minutes. You can see all the flour, loose flour, just keep pressing, right? Until it forms one large mass of dough. And now I can clean this bowl out, which I probably should do, but I'm not going to for the sake of class, because I put everything right here. Scrape, no scraper, like, sorry. Let me stop. Sorry. And then I'll come online. I'm going to scrape this off. And then what I'll do, what I'll typically do is, I'm going to go back on the camera here. You can do that. We go like this. You see me? Okay. So what I'll typically do now is I'll, I'll clean my bowl out, right? And remove the dough and then put the dough in a freshly cleaned container. Because I like to start with clean items. And so I'm going to rinse my hand off. I'm not going to take you through that part because there's no real uh, reason to bore you guys with this class, right? <laughs> I'm just going to wash my hands off. I'll take my container, um, grab a cover, just like that. I'm going to let this sit at room temperature for the next 24 hours. So for the next day, I'll come back tomorrow and I'll make a big dough ball, one big dough ball out of this dough mass and place it in my oiled USA pan. Or I'll place it in the fridge, depending how long I want to ferment for. So it's been 24 hours. I can place that in the fridge for one or two days and end up with a huge dough ball. I'll oil up my pan, place that dough ball, as you can see, directly inside. Here, I cover it up. And I let this rest to room temperature until I'm ready to push it out and stretch it. And then we'll make our beautiful pizza that we just made, okay? And um, we have a treat. We're gonna show you guys Mike's notes. How you gonna, how you going the time there? Yeah, we can, I can take so a break. So let me take a quick pause here to tell you what we did. So as, I was making the dough. Mike used his genius and his notes, note-taking skills to make exactly what I just did. 
And let's show you guys, let's take a peek. Wait till you see this. This is incredible. I wish you were around when I was in school, right? <laughs> but look at this. Turn it this way. Right? So you can see here, he just took everything we just talked about and made it, made, I know, it's like backwards. It's going right? the wrong way. It's like, it, it's like stage right, stage left. It makes, you can see he started with the dough, okay? And the dough container. Closer. Adding in, like, um, yeah, adding in. Like bring it up, yeah. And, and he took each step of the way here, right? We yeah. whisked our flour together, incorporated the salt, right? The flour, and then we added the yeast right in here, and we whisked it again. Then we took it, we measured the yeast with the micro scale. This is incredible. The detail is nuts. And then he puts, we put that uh, at room temperature for 24 hours, right? We say that somewhere. I'm sorry. I haven't gotten to that yet. Okay, we haven't got that part. Anyway, you can see the point is that he diagrammed this entire process. So now we can um, take this diagram like that, and we have this forever. And we're going to share this with you guys, yeah. right? We'll, we'll, we'll oh, share add some detail to it. It's, well, that's more detail. This is the diagram. So now, one, you've probably helped yourself remember, yeah. memorize the process just by jotting that And you down. can share it, too. And two, now you can share that. Now you got a dough recipe that you can share with your friends. Right? Some people are visual learners, so right? seeing this in a visual way like this. Now, See? probably what I would do now is if I had time, I would just think through the process and I would number these steps. And maybe if I... Another thing you can do is like you could do the rough notes first. So like doing this and then noting all the stuff and then you could redo it again in a cleaner way if you're going to give it away to somebody else, because then you could put things in a certain order and like lay it out with a process so that you could give, give it to someone else or that you could have it around on a card or something when you make pizza. You could give it to your kids to use, which is nice because kids often will even little kids can follow visual directions uh, and remember That's because fair. they're visual people. Yeah. Yeah, so think school, think anything that you're doing, right? It's a nice way to kind of, one, it's like, it's like doodling with uh, an education, right? It's, yeah. it's really amazing that you can sketch like that, first of all, that quickly. But two, it just helps you remember. So I thought it'd be a really cool treat to share that, you guys. Share that. Mike's genius with uh, pizza making and note taking all in one. It crosses over. It's a good crossover. <laughs> and the, the benefit is we get pizza together in a few right. minutes, right? Right. So that, that pizza's been baking for like last 10 minutes in the oven. I just put on usually about 20 minute bake. Normally 20 at yeah. 500 for me. Yeah. Every okay. oven's different. So yeah, every oven. I got this one at 450 so on convection. Fantastic. We're baking it. We're going to try to have it done before we leave here. So yeah. now is a great time. Let's get to some questions if we can. Ask away, guys. Why does the pan have ridges inside and on the bottom? Does it make the pizza crust have ridges? Oh, oh you're question. talking about the USA pan. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. You don't really see it because you're eating it, but yeah. These are like anodized. It really does nothing to the dough. I think it right. raises, does it allow air? I think the air flows a little bit yeah. better. And then these are, these pans are like nonstick naturally too. So really great for pizza, probably for cakes too, for that yeah. matter, right? But great for dough. It really spreads really easy. I pressed this out for like five minutes before class today and then. Went right to the edge almost. Almost went right to the edge already. Yeah. So really nicely done. It, 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 does it that. cleans up easy. It's got, it's yeah. got some kind of anodized coating on it's the really nice. Yeah, they're not expensive. That'd be 30, 30 25 bucks. 25 bucks on Amazon. Really cheap. We'll yeah. link to those to you guys as well. Um, Mike, publish a book with your drawing. <laughs> Marta, guess what? Um, he has. Yeah. He has. <laughs> you can go to... Uh, you can go to roadesign.com and you can see some of my work there. Yeah, we'll link we'll link to that too. Yeah, Mike. I post a lot on Instagram so you can see when I do sketch notes. I'll throw yeah, they're great. They're amazing. I, I I'm inspired just to look lately. It's either sketch notes or pizza or <laughs> bread. A lot of bread. So I guess I'm kind of into that. But um I make I made the pizza using monster cheese in mm. low moisture mots. I have a carbon steel pan without ridges, and the end result was yeah. amazing. Yeah. I use virgin olive. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, so like Munster's a great melting cheese. Mm -hmm. The cheese, grilled cheese sandwiches too, by the way. Yeah. Uh, it's a great melting cheese. It tastes amazing. It's great in this application for sure. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, that's the other thing about Detroit style. Like just, you know, use what you have in your fridge. Well, and I think the story about those pans is that, I don't know if this has been proven, but supposedly the the guys that work in the car industry oh, right. take these parts pans home and then their wives would use it to make pizza with because they were they were available. Right. I don't know if that's been proven or they can verify that, but right. I don't I wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, it could be this auto auto land here, right? So potentially, yeah. yeah that's great. Um Julio measures. So 
for this batch, this is going to make 850 gram, 867 total of flour, I'm sorry, of dough, which is a lot. We use 600, 867 is also fine. So we made 500 grams of bread flour, 350 grams of water, 16 grams of salt, and one gram of active dry yeast. You add those together, it's 867. And that's exactly how much dough this makes. So we can't mess with science. That's the, the amount of mass that we use. And the nice thing about that recipe, you can scale it up or down based on uh, baker's percentages, which we can get yeah. into yeah. if you need to. But um, any, let's see, what amount of flour that you use? So Kathy, it was um, 500 grams of flour. Marta, I'm an artist. I believe you. I love it. Everybody's an artist. I love it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's the nice thing about making pizza. It's like your canvas, right? Mm -hmm. So show us some of your work too, Marta. I'd love to see it. Yeah. I would love to know the secret of getting a raw pizza off my steel spatula onto mm -hmm. the pizza steel. There's a great question. I'm going to grab something for you. The secret, if you're having problems, is make sure you're using wood. Yeah, I agree. Right? It's not, did I see metal, steel? Yeah. Steel so spatula. So what happens with steel is there's moisture in the dough. And if you're using a moist dough on a steel, and you can do this, a lot of the pros do, but it makes that really stick. You get to work really fast. You want to use like the slotted versions of those. Mm -hmm. That's why we like the wood because the wood absorbs some of that moisture. We put our ball bearings on here, which is the flour and the semolina flour. Mm -hmm. Then we place our dough on top and that dough slides like a puck. Now we can launch into the oven. Without wood, it's very, it's very tough. So I would rec highly recommend getting a wood a wooden peel. We offer one at Baking Steel. This is a cherry wood. It, it, it's going to last forever. I've, I've sliced hundreds of pizzas on this. Look how good this is. Yeah. And that's a taboo for a lot of pizza makers. Wood, right? A nice cherry it. wood. It can really handle it. Patine as well. I oil it once in a while to keep it like mineral oil, to keep it nice and beautiful. But <laughs> get a wood peel. That's my secret. Um, what in the size of the pan? So this is a USA pan. I guess it's 10 by 13. I think it's not 10 by 13. Yeah. 10 by 13. It's like a cake pan, standard yeah. cake pan. Cake pan. Great for pizza. Great. Amazing. Mm -hmm. What else we have here? Um, when I make bread, my raw dough is four kilograms. Wow. That's, that's a, a that's a big baby, huh? <laughs> Wow, so that's a long bake, I'm guessing too. Four kilos. Four kilo. That's like four thousand grams. Are you are you actually meaning grams or? Yeah, is that that's a lot of bread, right? I'm I'm no metric expert. That's a massive loaf of yeah. bread. Is that you? Can you double check the math on that one? Maybe just produce a lot of raw dough and then you're ready to go. For yeah. A week. Did you sauce? Have the same as on our tomatoes, or did you add any herbs or anything? So we used. I, I think you say isola. There are San Marzano DOP region. So these are like, yeah, these are awesome flavored. Whole peeled tomatoes. I pulse these on a, with a food processor like for like 20 seconds and added some sea salt, no flavor. That was the goal here, just to use the, the fresh tomatoes. Now you can add some garlic, some oregano, yeah. some red pepper flakes. But I typically, I am keep it clean. I keep it clean, yeah. But feel free to adventure. Looking forward to your removal of the pizza mm -hmm. from the pan. I struggle with that. Oh, I am too. I think these pans are really great. So I, yeah. I have a traditional Detroit pan that I use. So that was the first one I got for Christmas last year. And then I bought this uh, USA pan more recently. The USA pan is great. It just releases almost magically so because of the co the coating in there helps it release. And then that's where I think those ridges also help it release a little bit, as well as the olive oil. With the traditional Detroit pan that I have, I have a little tiny spatula. And I just I scrape it oh, on the yeah, edge, right, right. and it releases. And then it, and then I use that spatula. I I use typically I put it up on the. Sorry guys. Back <laughs> for a second, just to get there. Thanks. Sorry. We had a little fire alarm accident. Sorry. Fire drill here, Andrews. There's yeah. Thankfully, there's only uh, we don't get to the main building. It's just in our in our union here. But uh, that pizza's almost done. Four, oh, it makes four loaves. Okay, that makes more sense. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you go higher on the oven temp? Yeah, I'm at 450 right now. Baking, this would be about 20 minutes total. It, it seems I have convection. I'm using convection. Yeah. I love this oven. It gets really hot. I felt that was a good enough heat, but you can go 500. Sure. Just keep an eye on it. 
is the dough ball you show in the pan, the full 867 grams? No, actually, it's a little less. The one we used was 600 grams. I'm making like three of these today, so I wanted to reduce a little bit. Um, so 867 is going to stretch even easier than the 600. And, but 600 still stretch fine. Still fine to reduce, but more sometimes is better in that case. I use a lot of oil in the bottom of the pan and the pizza released very easily. Uh, Debbie, great idea. I, I, used, I was pretty generous with the oil because that will help it release. Yeah. Peter Reinhardt, I think some people are going to use butter and oil, you know, around the perimeter just to kind of crisp it a little differently, give it a little different flavor. There's really no right or wrong answer there either. Um, I think the olive oil helps caramelize the crust a little sure, bit too. Yeah. Right? yeah, it does. Totally. It's, it's going to be a really nice flavor on those edges. We're going to see here in just a minute too. Yeah. Um, what position of my steel in the oven? Great question. My baking steel, I have one, I have two steels in the oven here, one on the bottom rack and one on the top rack. Mm -hmm. So I place this on the bottom. You guys want to take a peek? I'm going to do that. I'm going to take a peek inside the oven here. You guys can see this before we remove it. Dave, yeah, we did use olive oil for the, on the, in the pan before the dough went in. All right, so let's go inside. Oh, that's you can see that sizzle, right? That awesome. So let's go inside here. Oh my goodness, wow. Look at that. Crushed it, Mike. Yeah, yeah you want to see that dark edge there. Look at the those. caramelization on the edge. Do you, you see those edges? Forward. It's just about ready. Yeah, let's grab it. I'll grab it out of there. Let me move this camera back so you guys can see. I can hold the camera away. Take it. Oh, oh, good. I'll, I'll leave it right there. All right, so I'm going to grab. Let me use my peel to help a little bit slide it on. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Wow. Gorgeous. Let's go back up here. You guys can see this puppy. And you can see the steel position. If you oh, it's got, sorry. There's a steel position it's in the oven. Top. I put mine in the middle because I only have one, but it works pretty well. Well, it works really well. good for like broiler use, right? It does. Yeah, exactly. Right. I like the um, I like the top for the broiler. So I've got one on the top, and those are fixed. Those I don't really move those around much. In the bottom, and then if I'm making like pans or loaf pans, or I'm using my my inverted bowl to make breads, you know, I've got enough room in there without moving my steels around. If that makes sense. All right. Can you guys see this? By the way, let me, let me go down here again. Go back on there. Just so you guys can take a, a better look at this thing. All right, it's it's gorgeous. We'll take it out yeah. of the pan in a second. Hard to like say like put the nine to there, right? Yeah, you're sort of looking at these these caramelization edges. That's where the cheese kind of rolled in the edge and right. baked. When you pull pull it up, you'll probably see that all around the yeah. edge. Yeah, that awesome. You got the pepperonis are curling the way you want. Very good. Very good. See the sauce in there. Let's go. Like the this. dough is risen a bit. Let's go back. Should we take this out of here? Sure. All right. So I'm gonna take. I you know this is pan super hot. So yeah, carefully don't burn yourself. I'm gonna grab like a spatula. Just kind of go around the edges. And it's kind of fallen off the edge by itself naturally because we used enough oil. I'm just going to give it a little head start. All right. And boom. Oh my gosh. You guys see? Isn't that pretty? Beautifully done, right? Probably could have baked another minute or two, right? That's fine. Yeah, that's it's great. amazing. It's beautiful. Across underneath, it's cooked. Yeah. Oh, you got some good uh, undercarriage there. Yeah. We'll slice this up and eat it a little bit. When it cools off and uh, be in business. Any more questions, you guys? Now I'm hungry and and stuck <laughs> eating salad instead of pizza. Alec, I hear your pain, man. You know, if you're in Grand Rapids, come on by. Um, I there you go. That pizza is a work of art. Chef Kiss. Yes, thank you, Michelle. Agreed. Wait till we taste it. Got some hungry boys. Nathan's here too. Mike's son. It looks amazing. Save me a slice, please. Come on over. Um, are you sending? Yeah. So, Julie, we are recording this class. We will um, send it back to you guys tomorrow. Let me see one more peek here. All right. It's awesome. Right. Yeah. Good it's job, awesome. Man. Yeah. Good job. Um, and we'll um, record this, put some links to Mike in there too. And if you guys have any questions ever, give us a call back. Andrus at Baking Steel. Um, I love it when you have a guest. Good. Thank you. We're going to do more, more and more guests. These are fun. Thank you, guys. Mike's been great. Thank you, Mike, for coming. Yeah, thanks and, for having um, me. Guys, we're going to link up to Mike, too, on this yeah, so you guys can find him, check out his work, his book, Gavin's book. It's 
phenomenal. Got a lot of YouTube videos if you just want to get into it. So. Right. Good. Yeah. So we so again, here we go. This is Mike here, the sketched handbook. Twelve sketched years old this year. Twelve years old. Isn't it's hard to believe that's still being, right? still selling. But you guys are great. Thank you for Thanks. being here. We'll see you soon. We're out of here.